BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday, another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Last week for the Zodiac Monday episode, I said that I was going to conclude the Zodiac Killer News Report with a part two, and that is what you'll be listening to here. If you've been following some of the recent coverage of the Zodiac Killer mystery, you'll know that there was a documentary that was made called The Myth of the Zodiac Killer that aired on the Peacock Network, and... I was planning on talking about many different subjects for last week's Zodiac Monday, but I ended up spending 50 minutes almost exclusively responding to that documentary. That's why I decided to cut the Zodiac Killer news report into two parts. And there is also a reason why you're seeing this title for the episode, because the, there has been a major breakthrough in the Long Island serial killer mystery, and the news is just referring to it as the Gilgo Beach mystery, and that makes it really quite unclear just how many people were actually murdered by their suspect, but they do indeed have a suspect in custody named Rex Hoyerman, and I've done a couple responses to that piece of news on this channel, but I wanted to get right to the heart of the issue not reading from any other news article, but simply talk about how sometimes these high-profile murder mysteries can be solved. We saw this several years ago with the Golden State Killer being identified as Joseph D'Angelo, and now perhaps the Long Island serial killer has been identified as Rex Hoyerman. And one day, one day, I'm just hoping that the Zodiac will be identified, and we will actually know who committed those crimes in 1968 and 69, and then even before and after the pre-Zodiac murders, as well as some of the post-1970 uh, incidents involving people in 1970 itself, like Kathleen Johns and Donna Lass, who was actually responsible for those crimes. And the first point that I would like to expand upon relates to a Zodiac suspect that is named Loring Dale Hill. And I talked about everything very briefly at the end of last week's episode, so I hope though this won't seem super repetitive if you've heard that stuff before. But Loring Dale Hill is the, the suspect that has been brought forward by his grandson, Thornton Daniel Jeffrey, and his research partner named Melissa Rose Tapa. And they have a website out called ZodiacKillerBomb.com. And one thing that I had been encouraging them to do was try and find out some biometrics about Loring Dale Hill if I'm using the word correctly. And Loring Dale Hill was 34 years old at the time of the Zodiac crimes. He was 5 feet 11 inches tall, and his weight fluctuated between 180 pounds and 205 pounds over the course of his adulthood. And the source of this information was his daughter, because as I said, uh, Thornton Daniel Jeffrey is the grandson of Loring Dale Hill. And I mean, he simply called his mother and asked him for this based on my request. So I thank him very much. And if you'd like to follow along with their research, you can join a private Facebook group called Zodiac Killer and Me. And they are trying to explore more about Loring Dale Hill and truly find out what or not he was the Zodiac Killer. He was a former helicopter pilot with the Navy and then a naval aviation mechanic, and he seems like somebody who would have been familiar with things like radians and codes, and I'm encouraging them to keep going. 
And you can see a lot of their own original observations involving the letters and the ciphers and handwriting analysis in the Facebook group Zodiac Killer and Me. And one more time, their website is called ZodiacKillerBomb.com. And Melissa Rose has composed a, a rather interesting theory involving the use of the, of the word bomb in the Zodiac Killer letters. In fact, I don't think I've heard it from anybody else, ZodiacKillerBomb.com or the Facebook group if you'd like to hear more. And... About the Zodiac Killer mystery, there are going to be many different people who have many different takes on the subject. It is an unsolved case. And when I'm exploring this stuff, I simply want to point out, okay, I think this person's making a good point here. I think this person is making a bad point here. And also, I try to weigh the integrity of the individual. Sometimes I encounter people whom I think are genuine frauds. Sometimes I can encounter people whom I think are not fraudulent, but they're just misguided, barking up the wrong tree, so to speak. And then there are other people who might genuinely, genuinely have some good observations. And I just want to hear more from Jeff and Melissa. I think that um, they are making some strong um, and honest observations about the case. And before we continue any further, I would like to remind you guys that if you would like to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, you can hit the like button and subscribe. And you can also Go over to buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And now there is the Black Box Online Radio membership. The BVOR Premium membership via buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation nation monthly and you will get access to bonus content and bonus features including the guide true crime teaches us to conquer toxic people written by me ned dahan and a bunch of other uh, perks are available okay back to this episode now there was a lot of talk about that documentary the myth of the zodiac killer but there was also a new set of videos out on ray grant's channel and i did a response to one his first video on the timeline and the murder of sherry joe bates now he Else also released two more videos, and the third one was on the timeline in the Lake Herman Road murders. The first uh, Zodiac crime was the um, Lake Herman Road murders that took place on December 20th of 1968, which saw the deaths of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. And someone once asked me, which crime did I think was the most mysterious in the Zodiac killer's uh, true crime spree? And I think that absolutely it's the Lake Herman Road murders because we know so little information about it and Ray Grant to his credit is very good at analyzing these timelines and he shows that there's this conventional story of how David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen knew each other previously but they were on their first official date together David's being introduced to her parents and they go out and there are a couple different stories that people have about David and Betty Lou on the night they died. One of them is that they went to a Christmas concert and another one is they went to a diner and one of them, one of them at least, bought a hamburger. And Ray Grant shows about how most likely both of those stories are untrue. And a big reason that he states is by looking at the amount of currency that David had when he left home and the amount of money that he had when he was murdered. And he actually proposes a very strong possibility that David just simply went to buy gas. And is it possible that David and Betty Lou were just driving around and talking all night? It could be. It could be that maybe they didn't even, even have a clear destination. I mean, have you guys ever been in those types of situations? And this isn't Ray Grant's comment, it's mine, where you just get in the car with someone and the drive to the event is even more fun than the event itself because you get caught up in conversation and such. But Ray Grant uh, takes the situation in a different direction, showing that David might have purchased gas for the car, and could they have been abducted prior to their murder because they didn't follow through with any of the plans that could have um, that could have been made for the night, and their whereabouts do not seem to be accounted for, and there are way way more uh, specific reasons than that. But you can uh, hear more about that on his channel, and just go over to Ray Grant's YouTube channel, and he will share some videos about the timelines in some of these Zodiac related murders. I'm also hoping that this episode can be used to explore some popular conceptions that people have about serial killers. First and foremost, some people believe that serial killers are just individuals who have no friends, who have no personal life, who have no romantic life, and they just spend 
all their free time just sitting alone and getting lost in dark spirals of thought about how they can hurt other people. And then when they're outside, they just put on a fake smile and pretend to be nice. Well, that is mostly untrue. Very frequently, serial killers are married and they have children. And a prime example of this could be Rex Hoyerman, the man who has been arrested for being the Long Island serial killer, and he was married, he had children. He's also not just some small, sad, lonely man. When you look at the photos of him standing next to people, he is considerably larger than they are, so that as people are small and weak and they can't fight back and defend themselves, Edmund Kemper, the co-ed killer, was nearly seven feet tall. We find that serial killers come from all walks of life, they are both male and female. Yes, indeed, there are female serial killers, and they come from different races. They're found in all parts of the world. And a lot of the conceptions that people have about serial killers are heavily altered and tainted by the media. And I simply just get curious what the Zodiac Killer is going to be like if and when we can truly identify who was responsible for the murders in 68 and 69, as well as the composition of the letters. And I think that a lot of people will be surprised, because with Rex Hoyerman, if indeed he is the Long Island serial killer, I mean, the evidence is overwhelming, but innocent until proven guilty, he, is, he was an architect. And if you do Google searches, you might still find his LinkedIn profile and the website for his architecture firm. They came to the top of the search results when he was first arrested. I mean, at least when I was doing them on Google and Bing. And it appears that serial killers aren't always gifted underperformers and gifted underachievers. I mean, I think that being an architect and running somewhat of a successful architecture firm goes beyond those labels. So sometimes there can be successful serial killers who are a little bit um, a little bit more intertwined into some upper echelons of society. Now, I absolutely don't think that Rex Hoyerman would have been bumping elbows with billionaires or something like that. Maybe, maybe, but I don't really think he was that high in society, or he definitely wasn't someone who was on par with a high-ranking politician, so to speak. No, but he was a successful individual in his own career and right, married with kids, committed the murders when the family was out of state, so the theory is. And I think that we it's possible that we could find a lot of those elements in the Zodiac Killer mystery. The Zodiac also operated infrequently from the time of the Lake Herman Road murders to the Blue Rock Spring shooting, the first and second crimes. There is a seven-month gap. That could easily be explained by someone who just didn't have the opportunity to commit a murder in the Vallejo area. And also, he could have been stationed in the military. He could have gone out of state for a work-related reason. He could have returned home because of a family reason if he wasn't originally from California. I tend to think, though, that the Zodiac was um, either a native Californian or spent a very long time in California, like 20 years, so to speak. And, I mean... I don't have anything other than just my own observations. Okay, yeah, this is what I think about the case. Because a lot of people have this idea that serial killers are going to be someone who is a janitor, who just lives in a basement apartment, and he reads all types of books, and he thinks that he is so intelligent because he has self-taught himself a bunch of facts about things that aren't relevant to his day job. And no, that isn't a serial killer. That's just an ordinary person. And I think people have that conception because once in a while you do find serial killers like that. Prime example would be David Berkowitz, the son of Sam Shooter, also known as the 44 caliber killer. And when I watched interviews with David Berkowitz and I did a standalone episode on him this year, the overwhelming thing that captivated me was that David Berkowitz was just an ordinary guy. I mean, yes, he had some issues with his mental faculties, and, you know, he, he, he may have grossly, grossly misrepresented himself to doctors so that it's just a part of um, manipulation, so to speak, psychopathic manipulation. As I said, he had real mental issues, but he's just an ordinary average worker, and the only reason people are ever 
going to think about him is because of the murders. And other than that, yes, he did live a lonely life where he was unable to bond with people. But that isn't always the case. Sometimes serial killers are people who are going to be involved with high-ranking positions. Sometimes they're going to be involved in political circles. John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy were both involved in low-level politics. You're going to find issues like that. And I also wanted to use this um, as an opportunity, this episode as an opportunity to respond to some of your uh, questions and comments that you guys had shared in the comment section on YouTube, but also at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. That's the email address for the show. Anybody can write to the show there. And this one comes to us from Michael Fisher, who says, Hi, Ned. Really enjoying your YouTube episodes about Zodiac. I think you provide a thoughtful mix of information about the case without succumbing to tunnel vision or bias, perspective, needs, facts, theory, and conjecture, so it makes for an interesting show. My own working theory is that the Zodiac was more of a domestic terrorist. I find the term serial killer a pure misnomer when applied to Zodiac. It automatically biases the mind toward a Ted Bundy-type character, whereas I think the Zodiac was a wannabe Riddler or Lex Luthor persona. He is the Riddler from the Batman comics, even though he largely failed at it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, the Zodiac failed at it. I mean, if you watch the movie The Batman with Richard Pattinson playing Bruce Wayne, you will see a character that is based on the Zodiac. The Riddler from that film is directly based on the Zodiac, and I did a full response to it here on Black Box Online Radio. And feel free to check out some of the other episodes. But that Riddler was at least able to organize other criminals and turn everything into a type of um, true domestic terrorism, whereas the real Zodiac Killer was just some cowardly man who wrote letters and bragged about how he uh, fired some gunshots and ran away saying that he's smart and clever. No, he just did things and people didn't know what he was going to do next because human beings are not psychic. That's exactly how the Zodiac got away with it. I mean, in the DC Comics world, people have real superpowers. Maybe not Batman, but there are definitely other individuals who do indeed have some type of superpower. Well, those don't exist in real life, so that's how the real Zodiac Killer got caught. Or didn't get caught, excuse me. That's how he didn't get caught he, and avoided everyone because... He just fired some gunshots and ran away. And most criminals get captured. The Zodiac was also extremely lucky. Did the Zodiac start off with terrorism in mind originally? I don't know, but that's what I see him morphing into as he goes along. Like the Ripper with Mary Kelly, I think Paul Stein was his finale, and I think he makes that evident in the October San Francisco letter. He's not going to do any more killing, and all his letters and ciphers are much ado about nothing. The work of a wannabe bad guy creating an image all bussy of work-like said. I, th I say failed terrorist partly because at every opportunity... Zodiac has for creating a real personification of evil. He pulls back or doesn't capitalize on his advantage. I think the Ray Davis case is a good example of what Zodiac could have done out of the gate but fails to. I also note how Zodiac plays down Lake Berryessa by his most balls-out comic book character attack and mentions it only in passing. I think the Zodiac murders committed are incidental, but he kills... But he's, he kills, but he's not a killer. I'm not even sure he enjoyed it given all the attacks were hit-and-run styled. Well, as uh, pointed out, Lake Berryessa, where the Zodiac's wearing the hooded costume, is a little bit different than a hit-and-run. But definitely the first two and the fourth attack, the murder of Paul Stein, fall into the category I said about people just didn't know where he was going to attack, so he fired some gunshots and disappeared. He needs to build credibility, which of course he loses when he fails to deliver on his school bus threat. One of his few acts of genius is saying that he won't announce his murders anymore, a total terroristic psych out. The more I analyze Zodiac, the less of a killer I see, and more of a guy doing his best to try and mindfuck people, using the newspaper as his medium for spreading misinformation. Again, the Riddler, not Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was a killer. The Zodiac is just an asshole. Absolutely. I, I mean, I particularly like this point about how he's saying that the Zodiac, yeah, did kill people, but he was not a killer, meaning that the primary focus of the Zodiac was just attention-seeking, about building a persona that was larger than he was. And you have to see, though, no matter what, no matter what, even if it turns out that the Zodiac was somebody like, let's say, an architect who was married and had children and already had everything going for him, he maybe he still hated his life. Maybe he still 
was traumatized at an early age by abusive parents or maybe even neglectful parents and he entered into a marriage that brought him nothing and he just simply carried along with the steps during the day and unleashed his destructive tendencies by night and i mean we're not even talking about income and finances at this point we're talking about childhood brain development I think Ray Davis on the Zodiac comparison from a perspective of terroristic act could be a show idea. Maybe you've already covered it that from that angle, but I'm still working through the previous episodes. Keep up the good work. Mike from Texas. Okay, Mike, thank you so much um, for that email. A lot of good comments there. And here's something, though. Here's my biggest takeaway from Mike's email. We do not have to pick and choose. We can say that the Zodiac was a miserable bastard, but we can also say that... It doesn't suggest anything about his economic status or his uh, marital status or what his bank account had or what type of job he worked. I mean, we could all very easily be surprised as to the type of life the Zodiac lived behind closed doors. And one person who's been talking about this for a very long time is Mike Rodell, the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac, when he talks about how his suspect, Shel Cavale, was a Norwegian-American who was an extremely wealthy individual, a successful businessman, multi-millionaire. I mean, he... Um, was involved in the import-export business with automobiles, but he also launched his own car at one point called the Cavale, Cavale Motors, and um, it did not succeed too well, but Shell Cavale had numerous other successes, and it goes to show you that suspects can come in and come and go from all different walks of life. There is another Zodiac Killer suspect out there whom I've talked about somewhat frequently on the channel recently named Jack Torrance. And I said when I first started Black Box Online Radio that I would never do a standalone episode on Jack Torrance like called Zodiac Killer Suspect Jack Torrance because I didn't have anything nice to say, so I wouldn't say anything at all. I did mention him in my Zodiac Killer debunking series where I stated that, no, I absolutely didn't think that Jack Torrance was the Zodiac. I thought that the narrative was fabricated by his stepson, Dennis Kaufman, and that it was all just um, a pack of slimy lies, so to speak. And I received an email from Moonlight who says, Man, you are dead wrong about it not being Jack. He drove every vehicle alternating them. Zodiac Killer was witness driving. He continued on his journey of killing spree. Yeah, that's what it says. He continued on his journey of killing spree and left his signature marks taking slaves at several sites. He got quiet in the media and sending stuff to law enforcement. The FBI also shut down law enforcement from speaking about it and making them recant their stories in the news. He has upwards of 60 victims that no one knows about. People like you make me ill as to stop information from being heard. Worse than the FBI keeping this shit hidden while so many of us got killed. You did not live in my community when this was occurring, nor do you know, Jack. Do your research before you open your trap. My honest response to that is, no, I did not know Jack Torrance, and no, I did not ever speak to him. I did not have any personal connection. No, I did not live in the community where he lived. But before you present a true crime theory, you need a certain amount of substance you need a certain foundation, and all of those things I do not think are present in the Jack Torrance issue. He was the guy who had the stepson who said he found the Zodiac Killer hood in a piece of audio equipment, and his stepson also said that he found blood on a knife that own, was owned by Torrance. And I noticed that the Jack Torrance theory just keeps compounding, like it's just a giant mound on, a, on top of a giant mound where you have Harriet Suker also accusing this guy of being the Zodiac as well as being involved with the Black Dahlia case and the uh, abduction and possible murder of Jimmy Hoffa. And all I'm seeing is conjecture, mental gymnastics, lots of rambling messages like that one. And I think that you're going to have to show that there is more to it than just someone's wild allegations. Because that's the source of everything, of some guy who has no composure at all, being Dennis Kaufman, the stepson, going on national television, running his trap, if you're going to excuse me of it, I'll accuse him of it, running his trap about something that could easily be explained by an alternative. Dennis Kaufman made it all up because he wanted attention. Into Moonlight, giant rambling messages like that are doing a disservice to you, to yourself.
because it just shows that you have little control of your own abilities. But I would love to know what you guys think about the Zodiac Killer and any of these statements that have been discussed in this episode in regards to serial killers. And because this is the Zodiac and the Long Island serial killer for an episode of True Crime Talk Radio, I wanted to read some statements that have been shared from people who had closely followed the Long Island serial killer mystery and how do they respond to the events after this news that Rex Hoyerman has been arrested. And I told you that I corresponded a lot with Tina L., whom I met online, be at the beginning of my Long Island serial killer journey when I was doing the first episodes for BBO War, and I asked Tina about what was um, your response to Rex Hoyerman being arrested. About all I can say right now is that I think Rex Hoyerman is a sadistic pedophile. According to his Google searches, I feel he picked petite victims for two reasons. Number one, practical purposes. Of easy, It was easier to physically control them when they were alive, and their bodies were easier to move when they were dead. And number two, he picked youngish petite sex workers because they were easier victims to attain than children who will immediately be missed with full law attention. I also do suspect that Rex Warriorman is guilty of the Asian trans person because he did a Google search of Asian twink and the bogeyman. Long Island serial killer might be a combination of several serial killers, Bitch Rolf, Rex Hoyerman, and maybe Joel Rifkin, possibly others. And uh, giving a shout out to Colonel Reb, who also uh, pointed that out in the comments section, that this guy, Rex Hoyerman, did a search for the name Asian Twink, not the name, but the the term Asian Twink. And um, one of the un unconfirmed Long Island serial killer victims was an Asian male doe. That's what he's referred to as, even though he was either a transvestite or a cross-dresser, or some, something to that effect. And um, you can hear more about that in some of my previous episodes. But Tina has a follow-up by saying, He did searches for mature escorts. Not sure how that fits into my sadistic pedophile theory, but some like adults and children. It is more about power for them anyway. I guess an elderly escort might have been easier to control than a 20-something petite escort as he got older himself. At older and older. Then again... What is the probability that multiple serial killers dumped in the same place extensively? Might be more likely one killer's MO evolved over time, and he started dismembering the bodies, then switching to not dismembering, which could also have to do with practical matters like vehicle size. And giving a shout out to Batman66, who shared something with me about how the Long Island serial killer um, was allegedly um, committing some of his criminal activities in a storage unit, or they said at the very least, Rex Hoyerman had a storage unit that they were investigating. And this was talked about in so many different episodes by you guys. They're like, well, maybe he had a different house and he was dismembering the bodies. Classic Chevy Cat even thought that it was a uh, garage with a sink in it where he could easily wash and destroy all the blood evidence. I even proposed something like a van or an RV where he was use which he was using as a kill room. And a storage unit fits in very easily with that theory. And if you want to see a dramatization of this, I recommend the movie The Dead Girl, which um, shows a serial killer who used a storage unit as a um, means of preserving or kind of keeping evidence out of the public eye. And I, I talked about that on a previous Zodiac Killer news report. But I wanted to uh, see what other people had to say about uh, Rex Hoyerman being arrested as being the Gilgo Beach Killer. I Again, I do have to give the condition. He has not been charged with the murders that took place from 1996 to um, 2003. As far as Tina's comment, I think he did it. I could be completely wrong. There could have been a combination of serial killers. And it's been widely discussed. That is not a wild theory. It's been widely discussed because the victims from 1996 to possibly up to 2007 with the Cherries Jane Doe were dismembered, and the victims after 2007, the Gilgo Four, were not. So we aren't really, really sure what happened, and we need to see how this is going to play out in the court of law. But one page that I had contacted was the uh, page called Remembering Jessica Taylor, and she was one of the victims that had been mutilated and dismembered, and she was killed in 2003. She was 20 years old, rest in peace to her. And this um, message comes to us from the Remembering Jessica Taylor Facebook page, which I invite you guys to uh, follow. And it says, 
Hi, Ned. I remember you. I don't have a comment that pertains to Jessica Taylor in regards to Rex Horderman being apprehended. Just because we don't know if he's responsible, if what John Bittrell's neighbor said is true about John mentioning the two, then Jane Do the two Jane Doe's in Maynerville, then I would think John is responsible for those murders, and most likely Peach's Jane Doe, Baby Doe, and the Fire Island Jane Doe. That would mean that um, John Bittrell, a convicted murderer, would be responsible for the early murders and that Rex Horman would be responsible for the later murders. So it seems like the, um, the uh, person running the Remembering Jessica Taylor page is somewhat in line with Tina, although Tina did give some room for doubt as to what could have happened with... Um, with a single killer theory, just saying how, how many serial killers would have been using that for a dumping ground. It's possible that there were two. And I said from the very beginning, I think there's one killer, but I'm always open to a new possibility. And John Bitrolf was more or less the prime suspect of the general public. Like, if you were to get on internet searches six months ago, who was the Long Island serial killer, the name John Bitrolf would have come to the top of the list. Whereas Rex Hoyerman, I had never heard of this guy. I don't believe that his name was shared widely in any type of online sleuth community. I never encountered it. But because um, this page is called Remembering Jessica Taylor, I wanted to share something that I had recently read about her, and Jessica Taylor was one of the first victims that was identified. In fact, maybe she was the first victim identified. The Long Island serial killer began operating in 1996, murdering the Fire Island Jane Doe. Peaches Jane Doe and Baby Doe were killed in 97. The Long Island serial killer murdered a woman in 2000 who was known as Jane Doe Number 6 for several years. Then she was identified via DNA as Valerie Mack. And then Jessica Taylor was identified as, well, Jessica Taylor very early on because of a particular tattoo that she had. And I always said that this tattoo was cut up as if someone was trying to disguise it, but you could very clearly recognize what it was. And, um... It really made no sense to me. It just I instead thought that somebody was bothered by the tattoo, which said Remy's Angel. And I found an old news article from 2003 on a Murder Incorporated that was talking about that exact tattoo. And what it says is that this image that we've been looking at was actually recreated by the medical examiner, meaning the killer did indeed cut apart her skin and um, more or less eviscerate the tattoo, and the skin fragments were actually put back together and assembled by the medical examiner. So I think that really shows that the person was trying to conceal her identity, maybe thinking that if they didn't know who she was, there would be less likely that the um, case would have been solved, or perhaps very, very simply, this person hated women. The final statement that I would like to read to you guys comes to us from the Catch List page, also known as Catch Long Island Serial Killer, which has been on Instagram. And I've been following uh, this page from the beginning since I started exploring the Long Island Serial Killer mystery. And they write, Hey Ned, good morning. I appreciate you reaching out. I am just pleased that an arrest has finally been made, and from reviewing the bail application document, the quality of evidence used to support the arrest looks to be quite thorough. My heart and thoughts have been continuously with the victims and their families as they go through this and the next phase of this long process. It's been an exceptionally long few days, and there are many more ahead, but for now the world is a little bit safer with this man behind bars. I think that I completely agree. Let's talk about some of the evidence DNA was extracted from Rex Hoyerman because he was eating a piece of pizza and he threw the box away in Manhattan and detectives were following him and they extracted DNA from the, from the pizza crust and then they used that as com for comparisons. He was on their radar for a while and somebody asked that question, was he a widely discussed suspect? It appears that the police knew about him, that law enforcement had him on their radar for quite some time and they were just looking for the evidence. But I do have to repeat one point. I never once heard his name in any of the discussions or on any of the suspect lists and that they matched his DNA to a hair that was found on the body of one of the victims. He's been charged with three of the murders of the Gilgo four victims and it's expected that he will be charged with a fourth. And to conclude this episode, I would just like to say rest in peace to the Long Island serial killer victims whom we know, Valerie Mack, Jessica Taylor, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartolome, Megan Waterman, 
and of course Amber Lynn Costello, and to the unconfirmed victims who still do not even have a name attached to them other than the Fire Island Jane Doe, Peaches Jane Doe, Baby Doe, the Asian Male Doe, and Cherries Jane Doe. I mean, there, there are many more murders that have been going on in New York on Long Island all the way back to the 1980s, and these cases just remain unsolved. And someday, someday, I'm hoping that they will be. And this goes to show that it's possible. Because when we look at stories like the Zodiac Killer and Jack the Ripper, so much time has gone by, and people cannot figure out who these people are. With Jack the Ripper, I don't think it's going to be solved in my lifetime. It could be. There could be some type of enormous breakthrough. With the Zodiac Killer, I think we might have a clearer understanding. I don't even want to say, yeah, absolutely, it's going to be solved in the next five years. I'm hoping, though, through things like artificial intelligence and maybe some new types of forensic examinations that we will get an answer in the Zodiac case. But I, I'm just kind of waiting for it and waiting for the answers. But you can always respond to some of the challenge questions here from Black Box Online Radio. Do you believe that Rex Hoyerman committed all of the murders attributed to the Long Island serial killer, which I've listed in this episode? Do you believe the Zodiac Killer mystery will be solved in the next five years? Do you believe that other high-profile serial killer mysteries will be solved? Jack the Ripper, the Phantom Killer, the Axeman of New Orleans. Those are the ones that I talk about somewhat regularly. But then there are just um, other crimes that are not serial killer stories, but just incidents of someone was murdered, and we don't even have any idea who was responsible. And I've talked about a lot of them because Zodiac killer connections form very easily. Long Island serial killer connections were forming very easily. And then you have other instances like the Miami Strangler and the Route 8 killer from Connecticut where you do find clusters of crimes that take place in a certain geographic area. And people aren't completely sure if it's even a serial killer or not because there's so little evidence. It's just an odd statistical feature that there is a large concentration of activity. So it becomes very difficult, but that's why it's a mystery, and that's why we are exploring. All right, anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you over there. Until next time.